Hallelujah. Yes, go ahead and give him praise and thank him for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, that you shed your precious blood on the cross, Lord, for our sins, to give us power and victory over the devil, to give us healing. Lord, you said by your stripes we were healed. Lord, you've provided everything that we need, and we thank you for that. We're going to believe and walk in faith that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are grateful that the blood you shed, that your death, your sinless blood was shed there, Lord, to give us the keys of hell and death, Lord, that we can have victory over the powers of darkness, that we can have authority, that we become sons and daughters of God Almighty with authority and power over Satan and demons. God, we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated this morning. Welcome, everybody. Man, everybody's well. That's nice to see everybody back. We survived another biological attack, right? It's crazy from December on. Um, I do f feel like now I know which direction we're going this morning. Uh, so I was firing Kelsey a bunch of stuff to put up on the screen here in a minute. So she's madly working back there. Um, but let's go to First uh, Peter chapter 5. And we're going to title this, Knowing Your Adversary. A lot of you think you know him. There's a lot of Christians that think they know spiritual warfare. And they're getting all locked up in the devil's traps. But uh, I believe we need to read some scriptures. And, and we're, I'm going to show you some stuff that's troubling today. And I, I spent a lot of time studying this over this last week. I, I have video clips and things that probably we won't get to. Uh, just yet. There's just so much. But we're going to go down. Let's see here. Oh, let's see. We'll just start from verse 1. That's good. Hallelujah. So the Apostle Peter writes by the Holy Spirit, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he commands these elders, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, or just for money, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. It means you can't be a hypocrite. And he says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Then the command, be sober, not high on marijuana, not drunk with alcohol, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Interesting enough, the word seeking here is a present tense Greek verb, which means ongoing, continuous action taking place in the present. It means he never stops seeking whom he may devour. And that means he's always looking for a place to get you. He's always plotting against you. Then this command, whom, speaking of Satan, the devil, and his demons, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called you, or called us rather unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So he tells us here, the apostle Peter, that you have an adversary, an enemy, right? And he tells you, the devil. And he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I've seen a lot of little clips lately of these lions hunting in the jungle. And I'll tell you one thing about them. They're patient. They're patient and they're sneaky. And they will creep. Uh, they'll creep a foot and they'll stay still. And they'll creep another foot and they'll stay still. And what's amazing about them is that you're talking about, you know, certain prey, say like antelope or whatever, that are fast. 
that are very sensitive to their surroundings, that are, you know, jumpy. And a lion can sneak up on one of them. And then I saw a lion kill uh, a hippopotamus. I mean, these things are crazy. They will jump on and latch onto that neck and they don't let go. Now, he says here that it's like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, what lions will do too, they will follow a flock. They'll follow close by, try to stay hidden. And then they want to see one stray a little bit. Stray a little bit away from truth, away from fellowship, away from worship, away from holy living. Just stray a little bit. They're watching you. That's why when God spoke to Cain, he warned him. He said, sin lieth at the door. And in fact, in the Hebrew, that means it's crouched like an animal ready to pounce on you. And this is something I tell people all the time. This is why we cannot, as Christians, you cannot entertain and play with sin because it's like playing with a, a rattlesnake or a cobra. You keep playing with it long enough and you're going to get bit. As they say, play stupid games and win stupid prizes, right? But what I don't understand is there's a lot of Christians that say, oh, yeah, we're, we've got, you know, we've got the devil out here. We've got demons out here. But, you know, I, I remember Larry Lee, who was a famous pastor back in the 80s and early 90s. And he used to say, you know, when he was in Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, he used to say they were teaching pastors that, that Satan is not active in North America. Demons are not active in North America. That only happens when you go to Africa or something. But this is kind of the level that most Christians are. Don't talk about the devil. You give him glory. Well, then what's the Bible doing talking about? It talks about him all through the whole thing. And it's important that we understand how he works. And I'm going to give you some of the basics how he works today, but I'm also going to give you some of the most tricky ways he's working right now. And you better know, because I'm going to show you how that he has crept in and subverted nearly the entire church in the Western world. And I mean into a completely false, fake, supernatural experiences. Now let's go and read Ephesians chapter 6. And get ready to put up the definition of wiles here. I find this interesting. Just the word. The Greek word here. Well, let's start reading at verse 10. This ought to be familiar to everybody. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Now, that word power there, there's different words in the Greek, but that word is not the word for simply supernatural power. It's talking about authority that we've been given. So we have to walk in the authority that Jesus has given us. Now, we can't walk in that authority unless we are submitted to God. We're submitted to his word. I'm going to quote this verse. We'll put You guys can put it up in a second, but James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A lot of people like to quote that, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But the first part of it is submit to God, meaning you have to have chosen to let Jesus be Lord of your life. You have to choose to lay down your life, take up your cross and follow him. You have to have already chosen to repent and turn from your sinful ways and habits that God says are evil. So you have to submit to God. You want to be victorious over the devil I mean, I have people who come to me all the time that want deliverance from demons, but they hadn't truly repented of their sins. Deliverance is, I tell people, casting demons out of folks, that's easy stuff. It's getting people to truly repent and be prepared for deliverance so they can stay free. That's the big deal. That's why I don't fool around with folks that aren't born again yet or hadn't truly repented of sin yet. We're not going down that road of casting demons out because if I cast demons out of you, they're going to come back seven times worse. You're going to get sevenfold more. So the real issue is, have we submitted to God? If we submit to God, truly bow the knee, 
truly submit our will, truly turn from our sins, then we will be in a position to exercise our authority in Jesus' name to resist the devil. But so many of you are, you, you, you want some kind of magic formula to get free from your attacks. And really, to tell you the truth, a lot of it's just because you're rebelling and disobeying God, disobeying his word. And maybe God's told you to do something and you're not doing it. And then you wonder why the devil's just having a heyday on your, on your head, on your finances, or on your body, or on your mind. You must submit everything to God so that when you resist the devil, he will flee. Because what's the flip side of that coin? If you're not submitted to God and resist the devil, he ain't going nowhere. He's got a right to be there. All right? Now let's keep reading this. After he says, put on, uh, after he said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, that is, the word of God. You must know the truth, walk in the truth, love the truth of God's word. If you walk in lies and deception and, and doctrinal error, you do not have the girdle or belt of truth. Let's so understand that. He goes on to say, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, if you don't choose to repent of sin and walk in righteousness, you can't say, I am righteous. So you don't have the breastplate. He says, in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So if you're not walking in the peace of God, if you're not walking in the power of the gospel yourself, how are you going to lead anybody else there? He says, then it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And again, if you're not walking in faith, if you're walking in doubt and unbelief, disobedience is unbelief. Then he says, you will not be able to quench the fiery darts of the devil. Then he said, take unto you the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So you've got to have the Bible. You've got to know the Bible. We'll get to that in a minute. You've got to be able to quote the Bible to the devil. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, let me, let me just, i got to do this right now. I know it's just a little sidetrack here, but this just bugs the stew out of me because too many of you watch these TikTok videos and you think it's, they're correct. There's a guy that's done something about the Geneva Bible and starts saying that this word principalities uh, in the Geneva Bibles translated governments and that King James wanted it translated principalities so it wouldn't threaten his authority. This is about the biggest bunch of nonsense I ever heard in my life. First of all, there's the word government and there's the word principalities and they're two different Greek words and actually the King James translated it correctly in this passage. Not the Geneva Bible. In fact, the Geneva Bible gets a lot of stuff wrong. And the reason King James, just so y'all know, didn't like the Geneva Bible is because it was full of Calvinist doctrine. That it was full of notes and pushing the Calvinist uh, theology all over the world. And King James was like, I'm sick of this Bible with this commentary. He said he wanted a Bible with no notes in it, no commentary, so people could just read it and figure it out themselves. Oh, what an evil guy. Let me tell you, a lot of this stuff out here, you hear something talking bad about King James, it is propaganda. Okay? Propaganda nonsense. Um, in fact, every, every little video I've seen where it says, oh, the Geneva Bible translates it this way and the King James this way, and the Gene so the Geneva Bible is better, I find out the Geneva Bible translated it wrong. Because you go back to the original Greek and Hebrew and look the words up. It's real simple. So I know the Geneva Bible was used a lot way back in those days. But once the King James came in and took the commentary out, people stopped getting indoctrinated with Calvinism. All right. So stop it. I don't care how many TikTok videos you see and you think they're true. You need to go back and check 
Because these people sound very convincing at times, but they don't know what they're talking about. All right? That was free. Now, let's go back. And, and here's another thing. If it was governments of the world here that he was talking about, if principality should have been translated government, the government is something in the physical realm that we fight and deal with. It is flesh and blood. So he's not talking about actual governments here. So they translated it correctly in the King James Version. All right. These are demonic principalities and powers, not earthly. All right. That's why he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, let's go to this when he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So let's put the definition of wiles up here. And uh, you'll see it's uh, methodia or methodia. And that, now, that sound familiar, doesn't it? Method. So what he's saying is the methods of the devil. He says, compare method. Traveling over, travesty, trickery, lie in wait. Uh, you can put the uh, Thayer's Greek di dictionary up here as well. Same things, cunning arts, deceit, craft, trickery, um, to follow up or investigate by method or settle a plan. So he's telling you that the devil has a method. He has methods that he uses. Y'all want to know what his methods are? All right, let's go, just go to Matthew 4 and put that up there. Everybody ought to know about the temptation of Jesus, right? So let me just go ahead. I'm going to give you number one method. Satan's number one method to get you off base, his number one while to get you off base, is to try to get you to sin, to tempt you. He came to Jesus and he tempted Jesus, trying to get Jesus to sin. All right. And the Bible even calls him the tempter. That's one of his names. Now, he's not going to tempt you with something that's not that doesn't have already kind of a you already might have a, a weakness to it. Like some people, they don't have a weakness to pornography, but others do because they either saw it when they were very young or or whatever. So there's a weakness in them to that issue. So the devil's going to come hit that person with that. But there may be somebody else who's, who is so sensitive that they're easily hurt or wounded or offended by people. So the devil's going to make sure that he brings somebody in your life to hurt you or offend you. He knows how to trip you up. He watches you. He, he investigates you. See, that's what I say. He, he watches and he investigates. And he's going to find out the plan. What, what, what do you, what, what weakness do you have? Some of you, it is you watch too much TV and movies. You feed your spirit. And he's watching you. And he's waiting for you. It's like I've told you that story of the two dogs that are going to fight in a month. The one you feed and the other one you don't feed. Who's going to win at the end of the month? So if you feed yourself constantly from the media, television, videos, movies, if that's what you feed yourself, you spend little time reading the Bible, little time in prayer, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to be ready for when the temptation comes because the temptation is going to be take you deeper into it. And, of course, this, the process also is to harden your heart, make you a little less feeling. That's why, that's why you know, when you, know, you, go, to, you go to a movie now, I, I'm going to say I made a mistake of going to see, um, what was it, John Wick 4. I knew it was going to be ridiculous, all right? But the previews, the previews that they showed, I had to close my eyes. I had to, I mean, it was such evil. There, I'd never even seen this before. They had R-rated previews with the red warning on them. I'm like, what the heck is that? I've never even seen that before. Usually it says this is approved for all audiences, right? A little green strip. And I'm like, what is going on? But see, again, what are they trying to do to us? They want to slip stuff in there so they desensitize us. And because what? If we receive it, the next time they can take us, the devil's always trying to take you a little deeper. 
That's why, look, if a movie has sexual content in it, as a Christian, you had no business watching that. You understand? None. Why are you feeding that? You wonder why later, when the temptation comes, you feel like you're being pulled away. This is why, again, you got to feed your spirit God's word, time with God, the presence of God, worship God. You got to you got to feed the spirit man and not the flesh man. It's real simple. But the tempter is going to come and he knows your weakness. And you know what? You should know your weakness. You should know it and go, you know what? I'm not going there. If you were an alcoholic, you don't need to go witnessing to people in the bar. Probably not a good idea to go hang out in the bar. I know that there were preachers back in the day that had issues. They came out of sexual immorality. They made the mistake of thinking that they could go and preach every day on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. I've preached on Bourbon Street in New Orleans, and about four days was all I could take. You understand? You certain, certain places you don't need to go. You don't need to do. You got to know your weakness. And I think it was Sun Tzu, the art of war. He says, you got to know your enemy. If you're going to be in, you got to know your enemy and you got to know yourself. And if you lie to yourself about your weaknesses, then you are really setting yourself up for a fall and a bad fall. Now, let me tell you this other story. There's, if, and I'm just going to give you this. This is in, in Samuel. I believe it says Second Samuel after David became king. There says that the time came when the kings were supposed to go forth to battle. But David decided to stay home. Now, if you're not in the right place at the right time, if you're not in the fight where you're supposed to be and fighting the way you're supposed to fight, the devil's going to make sure that there's a Bathsheba come right in your view without her clothes on. Had David been where God said he was supposed to be, he wouldn't have been there to see that. And, if he, and, and it was a battle, so if he'd have been engaged in the spiritual warfare he was supposed to be in, he wouldn't have been home and then finding Bathsheba and then you know, calling for her and then the whole thing that went down. We got to understand, and this is another thing, if you don't engage the devil in spiritual warfare and resistance, he will beat you. Idleness, passivity, that's not an option. Some of you, the devil starts hitting your mind with all these kind of thoughts. of Maybe it's just depression. You just start, you start mulling over. Oh, woe is me. This ain't happened. This didn't happen. And this happened to me. And then, and then, and then. And you keep doing it until you are depressed. And then, and then it gets so bad you can't shake it off. And this is why a lot of people run to drugs and alcohol to try to feel better. Or, you know, doctors will give you a pill now. It's all kind of happy pills. They have all kind of bad side effects. But all they do is really numb you. And you don't need anything to numb you. So the tempter is the first thing. Now, I'm going to show you something else. This is what he comes in. Remember, when he came to Jesus, what did he do? Not only did he try to get him to sin, but one time, what did he do? He was, he was, he quoted the word to Jesus. This is what blows my mind. Now, let's, let's go down to where he talks about throwing himself. So when the tempter came to him, look at that. Thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. What did Jesus do? He answered, said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's a direct quote from Deuteronomy. Keep going. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Now the devil's starting to quote the Bible. He shall give his angels charge over thee, concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now, I know what the devil did here. The devil quoted this verse almost accurately. 
He just added in any time. This is from Psalm 91. So what the devil did was he took a passage about God's protection that's conditional, that if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, if you love His name, if you, if, if, if. So the protection of Psalm 91 is conditional. And the devil goes, no, no, no. Anytime he's going to protect you, even if you commit suicide here or make a suicide attempt, no. And of course, Jesus rebukes him. Here's, here's another thing where the devil is going to attack you. He is going to try to twist the scriptures in your life. Meaning to get you to believe some false doctrine, some error, some wrong theology. And he'll do it just by inserting a word or a phrase a little bit, just, just a little bit of a twist. This is all this is right here. This temptation is just a little twist. This is why it's important what translation of the Bible you read. I'm going to do uh, a one in the days ahead, knowing the, the Bible, knowing the translation of the Bible. But yes, I'm going to tell you right now, in English, the most accurate and best translation of the Bible that we have is the King James Version. I don't care who... Who, what scholar tells you what? I heard uh, a, a scholar that I have admired and appreciated over the years, though we've had our disagreements about things at times, but Dr. Michael L. Brown, I heard him make the mistake the other day of saying that because of some of the manuscripts that are older, we should go by them instead of the ones that are more accurate. There are some older manuscripts that are corrupted. Older is not better if older came out of a trash can in a monastery. You understand? Older is not better if it comes from Alexandria corruption of origin and Marcion who made their own translation. And all the modern translations have taken from that Alexandrian corrupted text line. Now, Remember, I'm talking about the original text. Does the King James always pick the best English word to translate? No, not all the time. And that's why I tell everybody, go get you a Greek lexicon, a Hebrew and Greek lexicon, and look the words up for yourself so you know. Okay? Now, now that we get past that, so we've got the tempter, and he's the twister. Now, this is what I was talking about last week about how important doctrine was. Y'all remember last week? If you, didn't, if you didn't see last week, you need to watch it. But about doctrine, I want to show you something. Go to James chapter 5. Just go down to verse 19 and 20. Now, this is how important it is to not get off doc into doctrinal error or let the devil twist the word or change it a little bit in your life. Or you just stay ignorant of it. That's not good. This is why you got to know. When I say you got to know the Bible, you got to know the Bible. You got to read it. You got to study it. You got to memorize it. You need to know what words mean. I was doing this kind of study before God ever told me I was going to be a pastor or a teacher. Because you know why I wanted to study like this? Because I wanted to make sure that I was staying in correct doctrine and that I would know the word of God well enough to give people an answer and to tell people the truth. I knew, even as just to say a lay Christian, just a 19-year-old young man, I knew I didn't want to be a stumbling block to other people and mislead people. Even if my intentions were good, I didn't want to be off base. So I studied like crazy. My dad said he'd never seen anybody study the Bible like I studied. I have entire chapters memorized. 
I would take chapters and look up every single, if it was in the Old Testament, I'd take a chapter like Isaiah 53 and look up every Hebrew word in it and write down the definitions. I, I had my own amplified Bible that I made. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to be able to rightly divide the Word of God. You've got to understand what you're reading. And don't just depend. If you're just depending on me to teach you, that's not enough. You have to do it yourself. But he says here, listen, this is how serious it is. His brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. That means to stray, to get off away from the truth of God's word and sound doctrine. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, you have to have somebody convert you from the error back to the truth. And it says, and one convert him or bring him back out of that error. Know what he says happens here. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. This is eternal damnation. The second death, being separated from God for all eternity. Not annihilation. And he says, see, he shall hide a multitude of sins. I shared with you last week, the Bible is clear. Second John says that if you transgress and get away from the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the clear, sound doctrines of the Bible, it says you do not have God. You have to remain in the truth of doctrine and scripture. If, if you start believing, say, for instance, that Jesus Christ is just a man or just the son of God or just and you don't understand the Bible doctrine that he is God almighty in the flesh, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. If you don't understand that and you start going down the road, like, say, these Torah heads go down. That he's just, he's not God, he's just the son of God. Or he's just like Rob Skiba, you say, he's just his right arm. You start going down that road, you have departed from the doctrine of Christ. You've departed from the sound doctrine of scripture. If you deny, hell is eternal punishment, and eternal damnation. If you deny hell, you're, you, you're denying what Jesus taught. And what the apostles taught by the Holy Spirit. If you go down these roads, and the reason why you are, if you err from the truth of Scripture, that you are going to be, that you have strayed from God and are in, in danger of judgment and needing someone to convert you, is because you're going to lead others astray and that blood's going to be on your hands. You understand me? You have to be established in the truth. Because if not, your life and your words and what you teach is either going to bring people to Jesus and to the truth and to sound doctrine, or your life is going to lead them away. And the devil is about twisting things. And just because something sounds plausible doesn't mean it's biblical. You understand? You know, I, I'll tell you this too. You don't build sound doctrine off of one scripture. Sound doctrine must be built on systematic study of scripture on a topic from Genesis to Revelation. You've got to know all of it. You've got to accept all of it. Amen? I can't tell you enough. Because he, this is the way he's going to deceive people. He's deceiving people the most. In fact, put up uh, 1 Timothy 4.1. Y'all ought to know this one by heart. This is one of the ones I learned a long time ago. And let me tell you something. If you witness to people enough and, tell, and, and talk to people enough about the Bible, you won't have to memorize stuff because you'll just, by simple repetition, You'll remember stuff. But he says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. What? Seducing spirits. First, these evil spirits, demon spirits come. And guess what? They must not be resisted 
if they're able to successfully get you to believe doctrines that they want and to get you to depart from the faith. Notice here, he's not even talking about he's not even talking about sin here. He's talking about getting off in doctrinal error. It's serious. You see, that's why I like when that I, I talked about it last week, that that so-called prophetess Julie Green. Whenever I hear somebody go, oh, stop with the doctrine, get off the doctrine. I know it's there, that they're there, that what's speaking through them, are these seducing spirits. The moment I, I hear somebody doctrine doesn't matter, I go, you're a devil. Because it mattered to Jesus. And it mattered to Paul and Peter and James and John. In fact, when the first converts happened in the early church, what does it say that they, they remained steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? First, then prayers and fellowship and breaking of bread. Acts 2. Right? They continued in doctrine. What did Jesus say? Let's put up John 8. I think I quoted it last week, but we're going to put it up again. The devil's got some, he's got some tricky stuff out there. I'm in this new one, this new one, the whole Tataria thing, and the millennial reigns already happened, and Jesus came in 70 AD, blah, 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 blah. Deception, false doctrine. Oh, I'm going to annihilate it soon. It's going to take about two hours just to systematically destroy and expose that false doctrine. But I, what, what I marvel at is how many people are just fall for it. Because they're just into they're, they're they're like the people in Athens. They just are looking for the next new thing. Verse 30. 31, 30, somewhere in there. Jesus spake this to the Jews that believed on him. Jesus said to the Jews that believed on him, if Jordan, if, if you continue in my word. Did he say continue in my singing songs? He said, if you continue in my word, then you are my, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You have to continue in the word. But it has to be the truth of the word, not anything twisted, not changed a little bit, not parts you ignore because you don't like those parts. I say, you you know, there, there's preachers of the Bible and then there's editors of the Bible. They decide what parts we don't want to talk about. That's pretty much the modern church world. It's parts we don't want to talk about because it might offend somebody. They might not come have coffee and donuts in our coffee shop. I see that, that there's uh, the Highlands is getting some competition. New coffee shop just opened across the street. <laughs> um. I couldn't resist. Now, the tempter, he's the tempter. He's the twister of doctrine, twister of the word. But he's also going to be, how do I put it? He is the counterfeiter of supernatural. Let's go to Matthew 24. This is where we're going to show you some stuff now. We're going to go a little deeper now. All right. And as, there, as we're turning to that, and we're going to go down to verse 21. As you're turning to that, um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But there's a way you have to resist the devil, okay? First of all, I think you've seen you need to quote the scripture and you need to be accurate. You need to stay in the truth and you need to speak that to the devil. I'm going to tell you, when you're getting really bombarded, Man, when you're getting bombarded with lust thoughts, you need to quote the scripture. 
You need to bind those demons also and resist them, but you also need to quote Bible to them. The devil hates hearing the Bible. Hates it. I saw there was, uh, Donnie, who was, who was the, the there's, a, there's a group of those apostles and so-called prophets that you came across that started commenting. Uh, what was their name again? I don't know. I looked at their stuff. Let me, let me just say, there's some group out there. <laughs> they say the word of God, the written word of God has no power. They also say that you, if you preach on, if a preacher preaches against sin, he's in error. Oh yeah. And the, huh? Yeah, something stupid. I, I almost, I look, I, I listed, I looked at their web page and almost everybody that's on staff is called apostle. I'm like, boy, they got more apostles than Jesus had. I was like, something ain't right here. I'm sorry, but I ain't buying it that you got, you know, 25 apostles in your church. Um, but just, just unbelievable error. And I'm, I was just, I was, my, I'm just, I'm telling you, my mind is blown. We have, and I'm not, I believe there's a true apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers. I believe in all the fivefold ministry. I believe in all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. I've seen every miracle you can imagine. I've seen the crippled walk, the deaf hear. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen people with cancer in, in stage four cancer, uh, bone cancer even, where their bones were already breaking, instantly healed. I've seen those miracles over the years. I've seen people in a coma and paralyzed get up from from a intensive care unit within three hours of after being prayed for. There's nothing impossible. I believe that Jesus is still the healer, the deliverer. He still works miracles. I believe in all that. So I'm, don't get me wrong. But let me just go on and tell you, everybody that slaps the name apostle on them is not an apostle. Everybody says they're a prophet, not a prophet. Even everybody says they're a pastor, not a pastor. Some of them just thought it would be a good job choice. And so they went to seminary and got hired by a church, and God never called them to do that, ever. And we wonder why it's a disaster. I don't believe Joel Osteen was ever called to be a pastor. I believe it was his, actually his brother was supposed to take over. That's why he says everything in the Bible is not his ministry. But that's another thing. Matthew 24, here in verse 21, when he's talking about the tribulation, he says, For then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of, of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ. Now I want you to look at that, plural. False Christ. We could say false anointed ones. Oh, because Christ means anointed one. False anointed ones. False saviors, false prophets. What is a prophet? Somebody that speaks by, supposed to speak by inspiration of God and also foretell events. But there's going to be false ones. And but, he says about these false ones, they are going to show great signs and wonders. Folks, people will get healed in their meetings. People will speak in tongues in their meetings. They will speak in tongues. They will foretell some events that will happen. And this has happened in history. Anybody, you, you want to talk about one of the most prolific false prophets that fooled many, many people because his prophecies came to pass and miracles happened around him. Look up Edgar Casey. I wrote about him in the polluted church. The man would, would put a book under his pillow, and when he woke up the next morning, he would know the entire book. He could tell people where they live, their address, their phone number. He operated in the supernatural. And I'm going to go and tell you, like I said a few weeks ago, these false prophets that are out here, just by the hundreds. Oh yeah, there's some healings in their meetings, but let me go and tell you, I've spent time in Africa. People go, don't go to the witch doctors and pay money because it doesn't work. 
in India. Oh, yeah, they get healed of stuff. They go to a guru. Go to the witch doctor in Africa. Go to the ancient healing arts person in China. There's all kinds of stuff. Just because somebody gets healed doesn't mean it's God Almighty. Doesn't mean it's from Jesus. And that what's so sad is, is that Christians seem to be like, oh, if signs and wonders are happening, it's got to be God. No. And also something we forget about. Do you know ministries can come along and have none of that? The Bible, I love what Jesus said. John the Baptist did no miracle. And yet he said he was the greatest of the prophets. Boy, would that go over well in the modern charismatic and Pentecostal church. No, because now what's happened is, is the goal has become the supernatural. No matter what. I want to show you. We, we got some false prophets and stuff. Let's, let's, let's put up uh, the praying medic. Now, anybody heard of this praying medic fellow? Me and him had a clash years ago. I actually rebuked him and warned him about this road he was going down. And it started about 2011, 2012 is when he and I had this clash. Look at what he started. Traveling in the spirit made simple. Yeah, we've got we've got Pentecostal charismatic preachers and teachers out here talking about that you can travel, your spirit can travel outside your body and go places. This is astral projection. Okay? They try to claim it's not. But let me just just go ahead and break this down for you. Uh put up the other guy. Didn't I have you another one that had it? Uh Bruce Allen. Oh yeah, here's another one from him. Seeing in the spirit made simple. Dream interpretation. Now, let me pause for a minute on this. Dream interpretation. If anybody's written a book about dream interpretation, I got another one on dream interpretation. You need to throw the book out the window. It needs to go in the fireplace because I'm going to tell you why. If somebody says to you, gives you a list of things and says, if you have a dream about a snake, it means this. Or if you dream about a vehicle or a car, it means this. And they give you a list of what things mean. You're, it's divination. Because the only one that can tell you what your dream means, if it's a dream from the Lord, what the things in it mean, the only one that can tell you what it means for you is the Holy Spirit, period. And, and something in a dream, like a, a bus in a dream, something that, like what, that prophet John Paul Jackson had a dream interpretation book he came out with in the 80s. He's dead now. But I remember me telling you the story about the woman who was healed, the bone cancer woman that was healed. I, you know, Baptist pastor's wife, friends of mine, brought him over, told him about healing. I mean, she was dying. She'd been to the cancer specialist in Arkansas and everything else. She was dying. Her bones were breaking. She had cancer tumors from head to toe. And came over, explained healing, that by his stripes, Jesus' stripes, we were healed. Elders anoint the sick and pray the prayer of faith. Right? And I said, do you believe it? And she said, they said, yes. Now, here's the Baptist pastor and his wife going, yeah. Because I, I just, for the first hour, I just gave him scripture. Anointed her with oil in the name of Jesus and prayed over her. And me as an elder of the church. And she went back to the cancer doctor and there was not a cancer cell in her body, not a broken bone in her body. She was completely, instantaneously healed. She began to testify. She lived in Montgomery. Testify all over Montgomery. About three, four, five months later, I don't remember exactly, I got word that the cancer had come back, and it was all back as bad as it was before. Remember, Jesus told some people, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you, right? Well, what did I find out? I, you know, I called her husband. I was friends with him. I said, what in the world's going on? He didn't know. 
But then a, a person that worked with her that I knew said she's got a dream interpretation book that she just can't put down. She just uses it every day. So what she was doing, she was using this dream. Every time she had a dream, she was using this Christian's dream interpretation book to help her divine what her dream meant. She was practicing witchcraft, basically. Instead of asking the Holy Spirit, what does my dream mean? Show me what it means, Lord. She was depending on this book. And when I told her it's witchcraft, it's divination, nobody can tell you what your dream means unless God gives it to them or he gives it to you. And he said, there's no list to decipher. There's no, there's no formula that you can write out in a book to tell people how to interpret dreams. It's nonsense. She didn't want to let go. She was addicted to it. And basically I told her, I said, okay, you keep on. You're going to die. You're going to die because you won't let go of this book, this witchcraft. So it took about a month of trying to convince. I would talk to her and just say, you've got to get rid of it. Here, she got rid of it. She finally got rid of it. We broke the demonic stronghold of divination and witchcraft off of her and commanded her to leave. And guess what? Cancer left again completely. And she's still alive to this day. But you see what, what I'm talking about? You open the door to this stuff. Um, oh, gosh. Um, when he talks about, go back to the seeing in the spirit, made simple. Uh, go ahead and put up the uh, Bruce Allen one, too. There's this book by this guy, Dr. Bruce Allen. Please don't start following these people. I was doing some, I'm doing research on this because I'm, I'm going to explain something. Here's his book, Gazing into Glory, Every Believer's Birthright to Walk in the Supernatural. Oh, it sounds great, doesn't it? But let me tell you what these guys are doing. I'm going to tell you exactly what they're doing. They're teaching visualization or what's called guided imagery or imaginative prayer. Okay, and this is where... You use your own mind, your own imaginations to begin to picture scenes in the Bible or picture places that you want to go to. And through this visualization, using your imagination, it starts to become reality, spiritual reality, because you're using an occult technique. I could give you, what, just, just look up visualization and witchcraft. In fact, they say to get good at witchcraft, you've got to get good at visualization. All right? Now, I've read, I read last night about 60 pages in this book. I know exactly what he's teaching. And what he's teaching is to create these images in your mind or places. He's got one, too, about traveling in the spirit or journeying in the spirit. Nowhere does the Bible say we do that. Now, this is what they'll do. They'll quote where Paul said he was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he cannot tell, right? They will talk about where John was caught up to heaven. He was in the spirit in the Lord's day, and the Lord said, come up here, right? Or when Ezekiel, when God grabbed him, he said, God grabbed me by the lock of my hair and yanked me up out of my, my spirit out of my body and took me, he was in Babylon, took him to Jerusalem to show him what was going on. God can do that. I have experienced it one time in 36 years where God took me out of my body to go do something, to show me something. I did not initiate it through chanting, repetitive prayer or visualization. I did not initiate it. It was supernatural. God initiated it with Ezekiel. God initiated it with John. He initiated it with Paul. They did not do this. We got Christians out there saying they can visualize the courtroom of heaven yes another thing you hear that nonsense run away i'm so sick of these dang uh fads that come into the church world i'm going to visualize the courts of heaven we got the, the, we got these crazy prophets some of this standing there looking at the devil's book of accusations in heaven the devil's book in heaven no you idiot you're not there it's your imagination And I'm not, I'm not, look, the Bible, you, okay, I'll be nice and do it the King James way. Brutish. Which means stupid. And it really is. It's mind-boggling. I mean, Chad knows. Chad studied this stuff in depth. 
I mean, they've been toying in the CIA and every in the military with remote viewing, teaching people how to start getting into a, a meditative state and start visualizing where they want to go. And then they actually go there. And this has been practiced by witches and Satanists for centuries upon centuries. The whole goal of witches is to get into an altered state of consciousness so they can travel with their spirit outside their bodies and come listen to conversations and do all kind of stuff. I've been attacked in the spirit by human spirits. See, a lot of people don't understand that level of warfare. That's a whole different thing than getting attacked by demons. I've been attacked by witches astral projecting to my house. But this is what they're doing. They're, these Christians are teaching practices from Buddhism and Hinduism, and they're Christianizing them. And, and I'm going to tell you, I believe this is why we've been in a season where we don't see many real powerful and notable miracles because there is so much mixture. God is not going to give his glory to, a, in the, and he gives his glory to no one, but he is not going to put his stamp of approval on something that's full of mixture. You see, what, like Mike Bickle, Mike Bickle, IHOP, International House of Prayer, 24 hours a day, seven day a week prayer, but this is what they're into. I have it for his book, Mike Bickle's book, Passion for Jesus. It's all in there about visualizing this and creating this. Let me tell you something. What you never heard was about Mike Bickle's crippled brother who never got healed. And how many prophecies there were over the years that he was going to be healed and get up and walk out of that wheelchair. And it never happened. And they hid that from the, most of the public doesn't even know that. But see, this is why. Now, let me let me show you this. You got my Jesuit stuff. Let's put up the Jesuit. So let's go. Let's go back to where this all began. Now, it goes back further than this, but this is when it was really kicked in. Now, everybody see that website up top there? Jesuit.org.uk. All right. <laughs> I was just. These are screenshots from my phone last night. Jesuits. The Jesuits were formed by a man named Ignatius Loyola, the 1500s, to combat the Protestant Reformation. His job and his Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits that they were called, their mission were to be the spies, the infiltrators, and the assassins of the Roman Catholic Church to infiltrate, deceive, and kill, and stop, and maim, or hinder, or get, derail the Protestant churches and Reformation that was spreading throughout the world. I mean, it was, people had finally broken free from the idolatry and false doctrine and demonic uncleanness of Roman Catholicism. So what he had to do is, is to, how do I put it, to have a, a group like this dedicated to this, you had to have a spirituality connected to it. I mean, a supernatural element. If you don't have a supernatural element, then you're, you're nothing. Okay, this is why our own government sought remote viewing and all this other stuff, because they were always looking for a supernatural element. Hitler was after, he was after relics that he thought would have give him supernatural power. Uh, there's always been this hunt for the supernatural. But Ignatius Loyola created what they call, and this is on their page, imaginative prayer. So this is going back to the 1500s. And he began to teach his people this, but this is what they used, y'all need to hear me, to supplant the real gifts and power of the Holy Spirit to give people a counterfeit, a shortcut. Let's, let's, let's let it explain here. We'll go down through the slides here. So what is imaginative contemplation? Imaginative contemplating is all about getting, into, getting to know Jesus. Now, that sounds good, right? It is a method of prayer in which you imagine yourself 
as present in a gospel scene. Stepping into the story and encountering Jesus there, it was St. Ignatius' firm belief that God can speak to you just as clearly in your imagination as through your thoughts. This way of praying will help you to see more clearly, love more clearly, and follow more nearly the person of Jesus. Now, this is what they say. This is the Jesuits playing the game. No, the per they know what it's going to do is introduce you to a false Jesus and a false Holy Spirit, a counterfeit, because you're using an occult technique that they've known about for centuries because they're saints like Teresa of Avila, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Madame Guillon, all of these so-called mystics, these Roman Catholic mystics, practiced these techniques, repetitive, prayer what did jesus say when you pray use not vain repetitions as the heathen do so the moment you start using vain repetitions over and over and over again you are disobeying scripture and opening the door to the demonic immediately so any any christian i don't care if catholic or not if you use repetitive prayer mantra type chanting type prayer you're opening the door to the demonic because you are disobeying the command of jesus don't pray like the pagan heathens do. That couldn't be a more clear command. And the moment you disobey it, you're not submitting to God. You're actually giving place to the devil. But the moment you delve into imaginative visualization, you are operating in a second level of this demonic occult technique and i want to show you that the jesuits adopted this because what their what their plan was the jesuits infiltrated every major church in the world they infiltrated every major seminary and bible college in the world every major university in the world and when they would teach people spirituality or how to operate in the supernatural what they taught them is imaginative prayer and repetitive prayer. Now, what's a wild is, is that back, say, in the 70s and the 80s, we were all well aware that this was satanic, demonic, occult, Eastern religion practices. But now it's been accepted everywhere. We got a little prayer group here in town teaching you can travel out in the spirit. How do I know that? Because some of our folks here have attended this meeting. And when you start hearing stuff about traveling out in the spirit, going places in the spirit, this pray medic says you can do it by your will. If you're doing it by your will, let me tell you what, what's happening. If, if, it's your, if your imagination is creating an image of Jesus, I can tell you, if it's coming from your imagination, that means it's not coming from the Holy Spirit. So what you have, if you've created an image of Jesus in your mind that you're praying to and talking to, you've created an idol. Even though it's in your imagination. I remember, remember SpongeBob, imagination. <laughs> no, your imagination is not what God... In fact, when the Word uses... The term meditate, it uses uh, these different words. It means your intellect level, your thought, your logical side. We're not, Christians are never to blank out our minds. We're never to chant repetitive things, phrases, sounds, words, until we, until we create an altered state of consciousness or a feeling or a, a spiritual encounter. See, what Satan has done is he is, he's given people who are hungry for the supernatural, but not discerning and not patient and don't want to do it the right way. They shortcuts. And these guys are selling these books left and right. Let's keep going. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. The idea that God can speak to people through their imagination can seem a bit strange. <laughs> yeah. Isn't this just uh, making things up in your head? Yes, it is. But they say, on the contrary. You get what I'm saying? Making things up in your head is not of God. You understand? Now, now, I understand. 
we use our minds, artists do, to paint things, and we use our minds to think about. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're trying to communicate with God and connect with him, this is not the way you do it. This is the way Satanists and witches do it. And here's what's interesting. A lot of these Christians that have started doing this mantra, repetitive type prayer, visualizing, and then this traveling out in the spirit when they want to, or going to the third heaven, they talk about flying through outer space. Jordan did it one time when he was, before he was saved, said he walked on Mars. But what do we know now? There's not outer space. You know, you start hearing one of these prophets talk about the globe, the sphere, and the space, and planets, and stuff. You know automatically, why do we know that there, the vision they just saw is not of God? Because it's not according to Scripture. We don't even, I mean, again, how do you judge visions, prophecies? By the Word of God. Well, Pastor Dean, I, I was visualizing and, and Jesus and he was talking to me and he helped me travel outside my body. I, I wanted to go visit my friend in Taiwan and pray for them. And I went and traveled through the third, the second heaven and by Mars and, and then came back down and laid hands on them and they got healed and said I was there. You're a witch. That's what you are. You're a Christian witch. And guess what? I was in Books a Million yesterday. <laughs> And there's a book on the witchcraft. I had to walk down the witchcraft aisle. One for the Christian witch. I went, Christian witch. Now that is an oxymoron, is it not? Christian witchcraft. Yeah. Now, I want you to go with me to this here. I want to show you something. Go to Isaiah chapter 2. And it's just... Uh, Oh, we're, we're, it's only 10 after 12, so we just got a little bit more on this. I want to show you something that, uh, how many of you are guilty still of not reading my book, The Polluted Church? You're in sin if you haven't. <laughs> God made me write it, and all of this is in there. If you want to understand the counterfeit, you want to understand how there's the counterfeit supernatural. That's why God had me write that book. Because there's a lot of people that write books against the supernatural, but they're against everything. They're cessationists, and they don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the power of God, and visions, and things. But I do. But I, I'm, I'm wise enough now, after many years, to know the difference between the real and the counterfeit. And this is what we have to do as Christians. And I almost call today knowing the source. Because you have to know the source of where stuff comes from. Whatever teaching it is. I can assure you, if it comes from the Jesuits, run away. They are not your friends. Isaiah 2, go down to verse 5. That, oh, house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, what is the light of the Lord? What does Psalm 119, 105 say? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when the Bible talks about walking in the light, it's not visualizing some light. It's talking about the light of God's word. Reading it, knowing it. So he says, come on people of God let's walk in the light of the Lord but then Isaiah begins to prophesy and he says thou he says therefore thou hast forsaken thy people the house of Jacob because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines and they please themselves in the children of strangers or aliens or the pagans heathens outside of the kingdom of God please themselves. Now let's break this down. When he says here that they be replenished from the east, that word replenished means to be satisfied, to be filled. 
they fill themselves with the things of the East. Now, Buddhism, we can go back 1,500 years before Jesus. So when Jesus was taught Hinduism, we go back to these Eastern religions. They were around a long time. Not saying that God Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has been around long before all of them. He was the beginning. Well, what I'm talking about, when Jesus came on the scene physically to walk here, when he was referring to don't pray like the heathens do, the pagans, with repetitive prayer, he was talking about the Hindu, the Buddhist. You understand? He was referring to this. And he's saying, you don't do it like that. But he said, here, my people have become replenished from the East. And they are soothsayers. They're not prophets. They're soothsayers like the Philistines. They're psychics. They're mediums. They're fortune tellers. But they call themselves prophets now. Or seers. <sighs> See, let me tell you something. Anybody tells you, I'm going to teach you how to see in the spirit, brother. You better run away. Because what I'm going to tell you is, what? You seek God, and the gifts of the spirit are as God wills, not as you will. And if you are with, walking with the Lord, he will give you what he wants when you. You don't conjure it up in your own mind. If you're conjuring stuff up in your own mind, you are opening the door for all kinds of demons. And this is why the devil will just have, have just, just do whatever he wants in your life. And he says, they please themselves in the children of strangers, or the, some translate say aliens, but it just means people outside of the kingdom of God, outside of Israel, the heathen. Now, is this the way we want to be? No. Now, let's go to Ezekiel 8. Now, this was part of our Bible study. Pelham, Friday night, got this ahead of schedule before y'all. But we covered some of this the other night. We had a good Bible study in Pelham. But Ezekiel chapter 8, this is where the Lord takes Ezekiel out of his body, his spirit out of his body, takes him to Jerusalem to show him. Had nothing to do with Ezekiel. It doesn't say Ezekiel was meditating or visualizing or chanting. But in fact, God took him to back to Jerusalem to show him what the elders were doing in his temple. Right before the glory of God left and he killed them all. And the Lord said, I'm, gonna, I'm about to kill all these people, and I'm going to start with these elders that are doing this stuff in my house. But this is what he says. He, he saw the great abominations that he saw in the house of God. Go down to verse um, 12. You can read this whole chapter later. It says, then he said unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. That means in the deep recesses of their imagination. Have you seen what they're doing? And he said, for they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. And if you go down, he tells you what they were doing. Verse 16, and he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, uh, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. They were practicing Eastern religion. The practice of yoga is to get up and face the east, the rising of the sun, and every position in yoga is a bow to the sun god. Am I correct, Chitra? It's sun worship. I mean the same as we get from ancient Egypt. They worshiped what? The sun. Roman Catholicism. Y'all have seen the Eucharist? Pull up, get, get me a sunburst Eucharist. Do you think it's a coincidence that they put the wafer 
in a sunburst and then everyone bows to it in Roman Catholicism? It's sun worship. S-U-N, not S-O-N. And you know when they say that Jesus becomes the cookie or the cookie becomes the literal flesh of Jesus? Remember the Bible said, if they say, behold, here is Christ or there, believe it not. It's a cookie. But you know, there's signs and wonders in the Catholic Church where they've had cookies turn into human flesh and they've had wine turn into human blood. It's supernatural, all right. It's demonic. They've had, you know, Roman Catholic mystics have wounds that bleed and are painful. They suffer. And then they'll just appear and then they'll disappear. Signs and wonders. Apparitions of Mary, Fatima, and all these others. Millions upon millions of people. Signs and wonders follow this idolatrous system. What did I tell you? Yeah, put up a uh, look at there. It's kind of blurry, but you can see it. You just just look up monstrance that they put the wafer in. Sun worship. Now, let me go, go and tell you, the Bible is very clear in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, that you're not to make any graven images of anything that is in heaven, in the earth, or under the earth, to bow down to it. The moment you bow to the sun, I don't care. First of all, ladies, if you're wearing yoga pants out in public, it's time to repent. But if you're bowing to the sun, I don't care. Oh, I'm not doing. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing. I'm not worshiping the sun. Yes, you are. And you want to know. You see, this is what I'm talking about. Knowing your, your adversary. See, he's tricky. He has methods and he loves to Christianize. Put Christian terms on occult techniques to get access to you. And if you open the door through Eastern religion practices, if you open the door, the demons are coming in. Now, guess what happens if you open the door a little bit and a few of them come in? Now they have a position within you to do more deceiving. This is why you want to know why the church is in so much trouble. And this is why I'm going to tell you right now, and I'm just going to say it. Pastor Greg Locke's church is going to go down the tubes even further than it already has because he keeps inviting these people into his church like Joseph Z. I'm just being straight with you. I've watched these false prophets. I saw when Bob Jones, the prophet Bob Jones, not affiliated with the college Bob Jones. This is a different Bob Jones. He's passed away now. But Paul Cain, Bob Jones, these charismatic Pentecostal prophets, Mike Bickle with them, John Paul Jackson. I saw when they went to the vineyard churches. See, I've been around a little while in this thing, in the 80s. I knew when they went. But what a lot of people don't know is a guy named Richard Foster who wrote a best-selling book back in the 70s called The Celebration of Discipline, who is all about this visualization techniques or contemplative imaginative prayer, guess what? John Wimber, the head of the vineyard churches, which the vineyard churches were, were all over the world and gave some of the best praise and worship music that we've ever heard. And John Wimber, I believe, started out legit. But he let these people come in practicing this counterfeit supernatural ministry. And it polluted the entire Vineyard churches, all of them. And at the time, Kansas City Church of Mike Bickle was a Vineyard Fellowship Church. The Toronto Revival was a Vineyard Church. Now, I believe the beginning of the Toronto Revival was God, and then these people came in and totally contaminated it with this counterfeit supernatural. That's why they had people barking like dogs and squawking like chickens. 
I'm sorry, but I don't see anywhere where the anointing of God makes you bark like a dog or squawk like a chicken. It's foolishness and it's demonic. But I have watched these people. I remember the Brownsville revival was one of the most anointed and one of the purest moves of God because I really believe of Steve Hill and John Kilpatrick, their hearts were sincere and they were about trying to keep it pure. But even at the end, toward the end of the revival, they let these people come in and start ministering. And it ended. I was there. I saw it happen. I went week after week. I went there for years to the Brownsville. Nobody can tell me. I was an eyewitness. I was behind the stage. I was in the office. I talked to Lyndall. I talked to Pastor Kirkpatrick. I talked to Steve Hill. I talked to Dr. Michael Brown. I was there all the time. I was counseling at the altar when they give altar calls. My One of my good friends was a children's pastor. So nobody can tell me. These people that think they know what happened to the Brownsville Revival that never went to a service. But I saw when it got off track. The great Azusa Street Revival. 1906 was of God, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit came. The gift of tongues came. It was a powerful prayer meeting it was so powerful that the fire of God rested upon the building like the burning bush. People thought the building was on fire and called the fire department. People would get within two blocks of the church and fall down under the power of God and get up and go to the church and get saved. But what happened back then is the, the, the occult spiritists, the counterfeit operators in the demonic realm came in pretending to speak in tongues pretending to have words of knowledge and prophecies for people. And guess what? This is the sad part. The leadership of the Azusa Street Revival discerned these people, that they were witches and spiritists and occultists, but didn't stop them, didn't expose them and cast them out of the church and make sure they kept the, the move of God pure. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know of a pure charismatic Pentecostal church, I don't know of one in the country. Because you open the door to people like, like, like Bethel who opened the door to these same people. It's the usual suspects. But there's a bunch of new ones now. I could... St I can name, I'm a, I mean, I hurt people's feelings. People are still trying to defend Julie Green to me. How many false prophecies does she have to give before you say, enough's enough? And you got this Hank Kuhneman guy. They're everywhere. But what's funny is I can usually trace them back to a ministry that is doing the visualization. I can show you in the polluted church. I show where Todd Bentley teaches that. Rick Joyner taught it. All the so-called prophets on that stage from Jim Gall to Shay on to Campbell, the crazy woman shaking her head like a freak. All of that. All of them who, who had all these mighty prophecies over Todd Bentley that he was going to be the next apostle of revival while he's cheating on his wife. Not one of them said you're in adultery. They all got exposed. The whole charismatic Pentecostal prophetic movement got exposed in 2008. And yet... We're still, for the most part, the majority of the Pentecostal charismatic church is still fawning and following and slobbering at the mouth over these people. Pray for me. I need a word. I need to be activated. Oh, God. I went to, I went to one of these meetings. Well, Greg, Greg Locke's deliverance conference. We went. And one of the speakers talked about, I'm going to activate you. I'm saying, you ain't activating me in nothing. You will not be laying hands on me. Activate. You want to be activated? Pray and fast and read your Bible until you get full of the Holy Ghost. Stop with this foolishness. We don't need to find some new technique that's really an old technique. 
Yeah, that's it. Old occult techniques wrapped up in new Christian packages. And boy, are they making the money selling these books. Because people want to be supernatural. How about just be super right now? Super at reading your Bible. Super at just praying with your normal mind, your, your words, your intellect. And really when it's talking about that, it's your intellect. We're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to know God's word and know the truth by our intellect. We're not to make up stuff in our imagination. But he tells, he warns, and, and it's interesting, going all the way back to Ezekiel's time, that the elders in Jerusalem were into using their the deep chambers of their imagery, and they were in Eastern religion. They were worshiping the sun. And what's interesting, too, is you go over to Ezekiel 13, and what do we find about the false prophets? What do you say about them? Verse, verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say to them that prophesy out of their own hearts. That's out of their own minds. Thus saith the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Their own. If you're if you're creating images in your own heart and mind through the use of your imagination, it is from you, not the Holy Spirit. I know I've said that before, I'm going to beat it into you. If I got to sit on the floor and contemplate and create what I think heaven looks like or what I think Jesus looks like and try to communicate with that until that thing starts communicating with me, it is of my creation. It's not the creator. And it's interesting how Romans warned that they would be worshiping the creature instead of the creator. A lot of people create fantasies in their mind. A lot of people <laughs> create fantasies in their mind. <laughs> Siri didn't understand that. <laughs> oh, Lord, help. <laughs> I don't mind repeating it for Siri. It's okay. <laughs> Maybe she'll learn something, right? But when I say know your, your adversary, when I say know the wiles of the devil, he's crept into the church. And he's crept in. He's more, he's more subtle and he's more sophisticated. But this is why Paul said, give no place to the devil. And I want to tell you, any submission to anything from the Roman Catholic Church is opening the door to demons. Partaking of their so-called Eucharist and their whole hocus pocus they go through with that. From kneeling at a, at, you know, they'll, they'll put the, the, the cookie in a little tabernacle up front and people bow down and worship the cookie. You don't worship the cookie. But the moment, see, this is why Paul said about idols. You know what he said in, in 1 Corinthians about, about idols? He said, the idol's not anything. Not a statue of wood, whatever. It's not anything. He says, it's the demons that are attached to the idol. And that when you submit to the idol, you have what he said, fellowship with demons. The word fellowship is the same word used for fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It's partnership. It's unification with. And if we open the door, Ecclesiastes 10.8. And this gets into the area of deliverance. A lot of people, Christian can't have a demon. Oh, yes, they can. All you got to ask is one question. Can a Christian sin? Can a Christian practice some occult technique and think they're going to get away with that? No, 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 no. If you give place to the devil, Paul wouldn't have said to Christians in Ephesus, who were saints. He said they were saints and faithful. He said, give no place to the devil. He wouldn't have said that if it wasn't possible for Christians to give place to the devil. 
And then here we have this, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whosoever breaks the hedge, a serpent will bite him. If you dig the pit yourself, he said, if you break the hedge, yeah, God puts a protective hedge around his people, but if you break it by participating in something satanic, demonic, occultic, a serpent's going to bite you. And let me tell you what happens. I've been bitten by a water moccasin. You know what they do? Fangs go in you. It's not pleasant. And they leave some poison in you to kill you. And that's what it's about. When you open the door to demons who Jesus said are like serpents and scorpions, they, they insert, they go into you, not upon you. They go in and they leave something in there to bring about harm to you. And if you've opened the door to the devil through this imaginative prayer or repetitive prayer or letting one of these Christian gurus lay hands on you, then you have given place to the devil. And I'm going to tell you that's why you've had more struggles in your life if you've submitted to these people. Because I made the mistake when I was a young man of letting that Bob Jones false prophet lay hands on me and pray for me. And the moment I did, guess what? It opened the door. It gave place to all the demon spirits of perversion, whoredoms, and lust that that man had. And boy, let me tell you what, I had a rough week until I bound, I repented first because I knew I shouldn't have let that man lay hands on me. This is before I really knew about him. But I had a check in my spirit when I got to the meeting when he because he preached. His sermon was so convoluted and off base, I should have known but I was young and zealous about, I want God. And this is where the devil gets us. We want the supernatural. It's nothing wrong with that. We want the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We want to see the power of God manifest. But we cannot open the doors to the counterfeit or take shortcuts. And I'm going to tell you what, it wasn't, it took me a week to bind other demons that came in from that and to deal with my own self. And then I had to help so the people that, that the church folk that I took to his meeting. Oh, Lord. So I had to help pray with them, cast all the demons, and then come to find out. When I found out what that man was about, I found out he was a sexual deviant. He was in sexual sin while he's in the ministry. And he's the one talking about traveling outside your body. He's the one that taught most of them this stuff. Bob Jones, that false prophet, that laid hands on me. So you want to talk about knowing personally. And so when I hear these people like, okay, this doctor, this doctor Bruce Allen that I showed today, I've got transcript of a video. I, I've got it in my phone. I just didn't send it to Kelsey where he says, guess what? Guess what meetings he went to regularly back in the day? Bob Jones, Paul Kane, the same suspects. They've been polluting the entire church world with their counterfeit, false prophecy, spirits of divination, familiar spirits. And let me tell you, there's a, what's sad is there's a lot of Christians who have come out of Roman Catholicism who've never been delivered from their Roman Catholic demons. Let me tell you. Chitra will tell you. Chitra comes out of, you know, she, she, she's from India. She comes out of, you know, her family is into Hinduism, but she said she never really, that was never really what she was into. She, she loved Mother Mary. Because, see, over there, you could just add, you just add a God in there. You don't have to get rid of the other ones. You just add some more. It's okay because there's so many. But when we did her deliverance, you would have thought because of the generational stuff of Hinduism in her family, that would have been the demons that would have been passed down to her. That, that I thought, well, that's going to be the stronghold. That's going to be the real strong ones that we're going to have to cast out. No. Here's when we got to the Roman Catholic idolatry of bowing and praying to Mother Mary. Boy, she manifested. And I know she don't mind me telling this. I mean, here's the PhD in physics. Demons taking over and won't let her speak. I tried to get her to say it. To say in the name of Jesus, she, wouldn't, she couldn't even move her mouth. She couldn't even talk. But when we got rid of, of the demon spirit of Mother Mary and Roman Catholic idolatry, she got free. Another lady years ago we prayed for that had been into Roman Catholicism because she's Bolivian. 
We started, I thought it was going to be, you know, she, she had all kinds of problems, constant migraines. She had constant, she had nosebleeds. She had partial in and out paralysis on the left side of her body. She had all kinds of stuff going on. She had to have a hysterectomy at some point. I mean, she had one thing after another. And we get down to pray with her and we're praying over some other stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, she had a sister that was in the Santeria and she went to like one Santeria meeting. And I thought, oh, this is what's going to be. The, this is what's going to be the big demon. No, we got to the demon spirits of Roman Catholicism that were in her idolatry, Mary worship. I got we, we, we bound those demons in Jesus name and started to cast them out of her. It was like somebody turned on a faucet. The blood poured from her nose. Like, I mean, just, it didn't just run out. It shot out. She threw up stuff that she didn't eat for dinner because she ate dinner with us. There was some weird blobs of stuff that came out of her. And we were there for a while getting the Roman Catholic idolatry demons out of her. But let me tell you, when she got delivered, no more migraines, no more paralysis, no more of these little issues. She was because she was having in and out paralysis, like just oh well, I guess kind of like bell palsy type stuff. It come and go, come and go. And she had to learn how to fight, though. She had to learn how to after that, she had to learn to resist the devil because she was a little weak and passive. She would say stuff like she'd start getting attacked again after her deliverance. She called me one time. She went to visit her family down in Miami. She called me one time. I'm starting to get attacked again. And I said, you got to command them to go. She goes, demons, you have to go. Oh, you need, oh, she said, she said, you need to go. I said, what did you just say? I said, no, 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 no. It's not what you do. You say, I bind these demons. And I command you to go from me in Jesus' name. You do it with authority and with force. And this is another thing when I'm getting to. The, 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 the principle of binding and loosing you have to do. You bind demons, you never loose demons. You bind demons and loose people. But it's simple. You get attacked by a spirit of lust, bind it. I bind the spirits of lust in Jesus' name. You get attacked by anger, I bind the demon spirits of anger, wrath, rage. You get attacked by witchcraft, I bind the spirits of witchcraft, divination, sorcery. You get you feeling heavy and depressed. I bind the spirit of heaviness and depression, and despair. I bind these demons and command them to go from me in Jesus' name. This is how you resist and speak the word. And quit being lazy. You're told to take every thought captive. That means control your mind. That means every thought. Somebody say every thought. Every Put this last passage. It'll be, I promise, last one. I'm Pentecost, so I get three closings. This is third one. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 there. All right, he says here, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. What does he say here? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling of down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations, not using imagination. Come on. Come on, right there. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Notice he said and. That means imaginations about itself right there. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. If you don't control your mind, Satan will. And this is what he's after. If he can control your mind, then he has you. Period. Because what you constantly think on, you will do. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Abundance. You meditate on depression, 
and things that are depressing you, you will be depressed. Maybe even suicidal, you'll let yourself, if you keep letting the thoughts grow one upon another, one upon another. You hear me? You got to know your adversary. The number one battleground of this warfare is in your mind. And your mind is your soul. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions, your intellect, your consciousness. Your spirit is completely different than your soul. And then you have a body. You are a three-part being. So, I'm going to tell you what, you want to tell you the main thing the Lord told me by when sitting back there about why he said go this direction today? He said, because there's still people in here. Still people listening to me. You've heard me preach on spiritual warfare and deliverance. You maybe even heard me talk about the counterfeit supernatural the devil brings into the church. But you're still being lazy and letting the devil beat on your mind, letting him tempt you until you give in to it. And you're still fooling around with some of these false contaminators. Like I said, I, there's probably 99.9% .9 of Pentecostal and charismatic churches in America I would not set foot in because they have not kept themselves from being contaminated. And look, we've had folks come in here and try that crap. And I said, I send them right back out the door. We've had witches come in here, Satanists come in here. Government agents come in here, deceived Christians come in here that won't listen and stop their, their stupid stuff they're doing. And I'm, I'll give them a chance. I'll let a Satanist or witch sit in here. Hopefully they'll get saved. I've seen Satanists and witches get saved. But if they start doing their hocus pocus and interfering with our prayer meeting like one tried to do, I stopped her in the middle of her prayer and said, go. You're not going to interfere with our prayer meeting. What's funny about her, some of y'all remember because y'all were here. But what I found out about her was that she ran into a friend of mine that lives down in Florida. And he told me, he said, did you remove somebody from your church not too long ago in the prayer meeting? I said, yeah. He told me her name. He said, she was talking to my wife. She had worked at a place down in Florida before she came here. And my friend's wife was talking to her. And he said, while his wife was talking to her, before he even got to her, the Lord said, she's a Satan. She's a witch. And then he point blank asked her some stuff and she admitted to it. So hear what I'm saying. Yeah, we're just we're going to do our best. I mean, every church, I'll tell you this much, every church. And especially if they're doing anything for God, Satan will try to send infiltrators to it. Every church and the ones that do nothing about it. Guess how many of their church is loaded with them and they're usually keeping the children that's where they go for first is the children's ministry. Then they want to get in the prayer meeting and interfere with that. Then they want to uh, sure love get into a Sunday school class where they can start teaching and build credibility. Yeah, there's an eight point plan that Satanists have to infiltrate a church. And they implement it all the time. You should be surprised. The Jesuits. Oh, we got Jesuit agents everywhere. Paul said we would live in perilous times, folks. And the Lord told me years ago, he told me, he said, you're going to have everything from government agents to high level Satanists are going to come to your church. It's going to happen. Sometimes the Lord shows me immediately. Sometimes he lets some time go by and then we finally figure it out. It's not my control. I just pray for him to show me. But you should be careful. We've had some, you know, we are very strict at Skyfall about having a prayer team and only these people can lay hands on you. And we've had people still, even though you got big orange badge on, only let these people pray for you. And we got and tell people in there out in the crowd, don't be praying for people if you don't, you're not, if we didn't ask you and you don't have one of these badges on, we still have people try to weasel their way down and sneak and lay hands on people. We had to throw people out of Skyfall 2019. Like, go sit down or you're out of here. Because see, let me tell you, shepherds, 
first priority should be protect the flock. So I don't mind people say, oh, he's mean. I got people all the time, they hate me. Oh, he actually throws people out of church. Like, that's some weird thing. <laughs> Paul did it. And he said what we were not to put up with. We're not to put up with people with divination spirits trying to infiltrate our church or people bringing in false doctrine or people sowing division and strife. We're not to tolerate that. We're not to just let that go on. We're not just, oh, we'll just love them until they change. No, while they're dividing the church or are contaminating someone with demon spirits. No, I had a witch try to come to my church when I was pastored in Montgomery. You know what she wanted to do? I knew she was a witch. And you want to tell you why I knew she was a witch? First of all, the Lord showed me. And, and she kept doing very seductive things toward me. And then she made the mistake of leaving her notebook at our house when I, after a Bible study we had at my house and opened up her little notebook to where she had a calendar where it said that her assignment was to make me fall into sexual sin with her within two years. Yeah, saw it written in her notebook. And she kept trying to get into, we, at that time we had a children's church ministry. She kept trying to get in there. I, oh, she was like, I'll keep the nursery. I'll do that. I said, you know, you're not, you're not keeping anybody. You're not doing anything. I said, I don't want to see you lay hands on anybody. You're not, you just sit down. And then finally I told her, I said, look, we know what you are. I let her stay for a while, praying for her, hoping that she would come clean and tell me the truth. And I set her down and I said, look, here's the deal. I know who you are, and I know what you're doing. And I, I said, I saw what was in your notebook. I said, now, one of two things. You can come clean. You can tell me the truth. You can say I'm ready to come out of this, out of the Satanism and the witchcraft and repent. I said, we'll help you and do whatever we can do for you. I said, but if you lie to me right now and act like this is not so, then you're out of here. Don't come back. So then she starts crying. Oh, tears. Oh, you, 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 that's the, none of that's true. I'm like, just drive the tears. It ain't working. Stop them immediately. See, most of you have been moved by, oh, I must be wrong because she's crying. <laughs> Actresses, no. And you know what? She wouldn't admit it. She sat there and crossed her arms and was a little... Got a little Miss Stubborn. I said, all right, do not come back to this church. She went to another church in town, and they just let her stay there. And she just tore it up. She had people in all kind of sexual sin with her and just dividing and false doctrines. And who knows? She probably got, they probably let her work in the children's ministry. So that's why, you know, when Nancy and I, we had a little break in like 2010 where we weren't doing the church so we would we'd go to other churches sometimes did we ever drop little faith marie off in a nursery anywhere no never either she'd be in the little car seat in the next to us i remember walking into one church where were we in georgia we looked in the children's room it was like uh-uh Oh, but it's a church. Shouldn't we trust the people in the church? Aren't they all sweet little Christians? No, they're not. No, they're not. Know your adversary. Because what does it say in, in 2 Corinthians 2, 11? If we are ignorant of the devil's devices, he will get an advantage over us. Ignorance will kill you. Ignorance will open the doors. So let's stand. You got a good one? All right. Let's do a song before we leave. I know you've been here a little while. But like I said, you know, you know, back in the old days, you had church Sunday morning and then you had church Sunday night. So what I do is just combine the two. 
But again, what you're getting here, this is not sermonettes for Christianettes. This is teaching. This is training. And this is why we're here longer than the mega church down there. And when, if your minds don't get into the chips and salsa more than getting the word in you, then there's a problem. But if I got you one day a week, I'm going to keep you for a good college class. All right. All right. Well, let's let's worship the Lord with this song here. This I, I, I love this song. Uh, six minutes. Let's give the Lord six minutes of worship before we go. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. You are the true and mighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, Lord. And Lord God, you can reveal yourself to us without us using our own imaginations to create our own visions and ideas. Lord, you will reveal yourself. And Holy Spirit, we know you move as you will, not as we will. And we want the real thing, Lord. We want the real gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, words of knowledge, gifts of healing and working of miracles, discerning of spirits, faith, tongues and interpretation of tongues, Lord. True visions and dreams that are from you and not conjured up in our own minds. Lord, we don't want any occult, satanic origins or sources or practices. We want you. And that's what we pray for. And we're willing to wait and not cheat. We thank you for it, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, somebody praise the Lord in this place. Just so you know, we are going to be uh, fellowship and eating downstairs. So if you want to stay, go down, go get you something to eat, come back, and we'll be here for a little while. Um, we were going to have a baptism that is canceled, and uh, I will explain why in a minute to the individual. But um, so... Yeah, Fire and Grace School of Ministry applications are due by August the 1st. So get the, you need to get started because some of if you're going to get your recommendations, uh, pastoral recommendations and others. Now, if you don't have a pastor um, because you just can't find a church and you haven't had a relationship with a pastor, that's okay. Just send it in anyway. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we don't make that an absolute deal breaker or anything. But anyway get on that and let me just say this too about deliverance if you want to know more about deliverance and there it is fgministryschool.com on the screen there apply by august 1st um and that's the only time to get in the school you can do part-time or full-time but uh, but about deliverance and if you can go to dnodal.org and hit the deliverance button show them there um you can go there and what I, what we have people do because people contact me about deliverance all the time I have people, before we do anything, they have to listen to the entire Deliverance series teaching, and then they fill out our 100-question questionnaire. But do not send us your questionnaire. We do not want that. That is for you, okay? What we encourage people to do is to make their list and start praying through it themselves and do as much as you can yourselves. If you get to a part where or you do it and you think you still need help, then uh, then after that's when we talk and consider what needs to be done next. But uh, it's something that you need to pursue and you need to do those things. So I tell people they need to watch the Deliverance series. So all questions and false doctrine and things that you've been taught by your denomination gets out of your head. and You just get the word of God in you on the subject. And then that way your faith, not in Pastor Dean, was in the word and what needs to be done. And let me tell you what, we don't we don't talk to demons. We don't have long conversations with demons. Matter of fact, most time when we pray for people, we don't have, I don't let them, I say, what did Jesus, demons start talking with Jesus, say, shut up, hold your peace, come out of them. We deal with it that way. We also deal with it in a way we, where we don't try to embarrass anybody. We try to deal most of it in private. I have had some things in public manifest. We'll deal with what we can, but a thorough deliverance cannot be done five minutes at an altar somewhere, okay? It has to be, to cover everything, you got to be thorough. So it's more about discipleship and thoroughly cleaning out. So if you heard me mention that and you want to find out more about it, that maybe it's the first time you've heard anything about it, go to deanodal.org and click on the deliverance button and everything's there. The PDF, yeah, it's on the home page. The button's there. You just scroll down and you'll see the deliverance uh, button there. And it's got the link to take you to the the series, the teaching series on it. And it's got the PDF for the, uh, 
questionnaire. And there's also a book. There's the is the Freemasonry book with all the Freemasonry stuff. That's on Fire and Grace Church. We got to get it on this one too. But Fire and Grace Church. Uh, dot org the if you've had freemasonry in your family you need to go through that all right well y'all know the, the drill hug some necks before you leave if you're going to stick around go get you something to eat come on back all right all right god bless <laughs>